everyone. I'm Nina Collins. I'm the Chief Creative Officer at Revel, and this is our weekly <laughs> podcast recording. Raging Gracefully is the name of our podcast. You can find it everywhere you find podcasts. And today we're in conversation with Helena Andrews Dyer, who's a journalist from DC, who has written, I think this is her third book. It is. Book. It's her third book. I've never read her before. It's called The Mamas, What I Learned About Kids, Class, and Race from Moms Not Like Me. It just came out in August. It's so funny and smart, I have to say. So I chose this book. It's a little bit of an unusual book for us because of course Revel is a community for women over 40, right? So in some ways we have a lot of things in common with you because we started, at least my community, the Wolfer community started as a Facebook group. So all the Facebook drama stuff you talk about, <laughs> very, very, very familiar to me. It started, my group started as like me and a bunch of my friends and it grew to 32,000 women. Eventually I took it off Facebook and it became a business called the Wolfer. And then last year it was bought by Revel, which uh, was a tech startup that started a few years ago. These two really smart young women from Harvard Business School who basically wanted to create like a meetup for women over 50. So, but we are women over 40. We are not women who are dealing with babies anymore. But when I read about your book in Publishers Weekly, I was super interested because we of course deal, I mean, all these issues of community and black women and white women and all of us getting along and wokeness in 2020 <laughs> and you know, all of those things are very, very relevant. And so I was just interested. So I wrote to your publisher and got a galley and then I started reading it and I just loved it. So I just Thank want you. everyone to know about it. I just think you're so funny and clever. Like I, you know, and I'm a little bit of a writer myself. Actually, that's my book behind me. Um, but you're such a, so much of a better writer. Like I was just so impressed with what you pull off here constantly. So I want to know um, what your next book is, but of course we have to talk about this one. <laughs> um, so, Okay, tell us also what your earlier books were, because there were two interesting books, so it just because so everyone can know. Yes, so my first book, right behind me, was called Bitches in New Black. This came out in 2010, which seems so long ago. Um, and this was a book, it was straight memoir, right? So The Mamas is memoir, but it's also reported. I'm a journalist, I'm a reporter for The Washington Post, I've been there for almost a decade. So but the uh, Bitches in New Black was a straight memoir about what it was like being, you know, young, gifted, and black, basically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at a time where that was something that wasn't discussed in the media before. A lot of people, a lot of fans of that book, will say it was like, you know, their Sex in the City. But then I dealt with a bunch of other stuff. I dealt with relationships, being the only one at work, um, my own very sort of like interesting upbringing. Um, you know, my mother is this hippie lesbian woman from California. At one point, she and oh, I lived you, in you island. Lived in Catalina. I thought that was so weird. Yes. I like, who? I actually was googling Catalina. I was like, who lives in <laughs> Catalina Island? But you were there in like elementary school. Then you went to high school in South Central. Um, middle school and high school. Yes, yes. So my family is from Los Angeles. We're from, from South Los Angeles. Um, but my mother and I lived on on Avalon for a good chunk of my childhood. So it was like all of this, right? So that was that. That was which is new life. That was my first book, and then my second book, Reclaiming Her Time: The Power of Masculine Waters, which I wrote with our Eric Thomas, who was also hilarious. Um, and that's an, a biography we wrote about Auntie um, Maxine that came out in 2020. And then the mamas came out last month. Now, and what's your next book? I'm sorry. And then we'll go to the mamas. I'm just interested. In uh, so, so th this next project I'm working on is kind of hush hush. Um, but it's going to be right. good. Well, you'll have <laughs> be really good. And how old are your two daughters? I'm guessing now they're like four and six. Um, almost my older daughter is five and our younger daughter just turned three, uh, this past weekend. Okay. All right. So, so still very year. young. To give you just a little context, basically the book is about, and you, your, your name is pronounced Helena or Helena? Wait, hold on, you're frozen. Helena, Helena. 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 Okay. okay. Um, so Helena, the book is basically, Helena is like a young journalist, successful journalist of the Washington Post, and she's living in DC, and it's about having her first two, having her two children, and becoming part of this mom's community in her, she lives in this neighborhood that, um, yeah, I was black. It's called Bloomingdale. I'd never heard of it. It's right near Howard. It was fascinating. The way you wrote about Bloomingdale, that whole chapter was super, super interesting. You know, the history of 
redlining and black people being what was the term for it where they were like literally like not allowed to buy certain houses like there were leases or deeds that prevented you from selling um, so that was those are racial covenants racial, racial covenants, covenants right and that's something that essentially you would write in the deed of your home it would say you this home cannot be sold to a non-white person right and that was their racial covenants obviously covering black people jewish people hispanic people basically like you can't sell this home to someone who is not white. And if you do, you would be like incur some fine or the people who would move in, the non-white people who would move in and the other white neighbors would sue them to get them to move. And there, there were cases in DC where these people were successfully sued. Like folks were forced to leave homes that they bought um, because they bought in white neighborhoods. It's crazy. And then you'd go, it, it, it seemed like from the book, you didn't really know that history of your neighborhood until you started writing this book. And then you really dug into it and you talk about the court cases and how it was, you know, failed. Oh shoot, we're losing each other a little bit. Um, so, so this is the story. So she's in this neighborhood in DC and she starts becoming friends with these moms. And she's basically the only black woman in this mom group. And, and there are like three different groups and that doesn't really matter. The whole book is basically about being a black mom and what she's thinking about race. And there's so much that's interesting in here. I, I guess, all right, so relevant to our community, one of the things that really interested me was that chapter about your mom. I mean, this is much later in the book, but I, I read it as both kind of, I related to it as a young mom and like what it's like having mom friends. Cause of course, once you start growing up, those mom friends don't matter as much, which you talk about in your book. But I also related to it as a parent myself and like how you start kind of, how you all hate your moms, I think is really I funny. Losing you, hold on. Oh, there you are. I was just looking at my back. You're back. Do you think okay. you have a better connection now? I am hoping so. This connection usually I'm so we live in a row house and of course our internet is in the basement and I'm on the top floor, but this usually works fine. So I think we are okay. <laughs> but I think it's me. I, I, I think I'm all right. Person. Well, someone in the audience says even the little bit we heard makes me want to read the book and I'm not even a parent. Good. Well, you will want to read the book, Christine, I'm telling you, and you don't have to be a parent because as I was literally, as I picked the book up, I was thinking, why am I doing this for the podcast? Like we're not mommies anymore. And then I got so engrossed in this book, I couldn't put it down. Like I really loved it. So it's, it's really about race and womanhood and identity. And I suppose the part that is younger than our demographic is there's, there's definitely that kind of grappling with just like who I am in the world, because you're, it sounds like your first book, you were talking about being black in a white world in a lot of ways right and what that is and then you're like layering it in this book you're layering it with parenting suddenly you have to bring these yes. two girls up and it's and there's your relationship with your own mom so yes. i guess my first question to you is in retrospect now that this book is out what did you learn from this book how did this book change you Whew, that's a deep question i would think when you are so i am a memoirist right and when you are writing memoir and writing about things that happened to you, you are learning about yourself as you're exploring these different things, right? And I didn't set out to write a book about belonging. Like I knew that was the, the topic, but um, I wasn't sure how deep it would be until I got into the writing of it. And I think what I realized, especially as you take on all these different identities. That's another thing I didn't realize about myself. Someone in an earlier interview was like, you've existed in a lot of different spheres mm -hmm. in your life, right? And and that is very true. I've been all over, right? I, well, I even in- even, and, Yeah, and even in this book, like you're in many mommy groups, right? I you're, am. You're, because you're, I'm you're, someone who moves through yeah. circles, right? And that's something I like always knew about myself, but to see it like plotted out very clearly, especially at the end of the book where I say, you know, my mommy group cup runneth over. Mm -hmm. uh, I am someone who exists in a lot of different spheres because I think there are a lot of layers to, to who I am as everyone has a lot of layers to who they are. But what I tried to explore in the book and what I came to know about myself, especially as I'm putting on this new identity as, of mother is the question of authenticity, which is always something that I think, especially as Black people, we have in the back of our minds, it's all about keeping it real, you know, and making sure, you know, keeping it 100. It's like, what does that mean? Um, that it's something, one, I'm constantly discovering by myself, about myself. I don't have this like one set identity, but the core of who I am, I think, is something that I have carried into all of these different spheres of my life, which is why I'm able to exist in so many different spheres. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that is what I sort of came to because when, when it came to the girls, when I became a mother and I write about this in the book, like I am not necessarily a very, I feel like I'm a nurturing person, but I wasn't a very maternal person, you know, and I write about that in the chapter about my mom, because when she got really sick, mm -hmm. I'm an only child. It's just, she's a single parent. It's just she and I, and suddenly I had to step into a mothering role as I was mothering my own mother. And I was just like, I am not prepared for this. I'm like, and put, suddenly you were pretty judgmental about her. You were pissed. Yes, it seems like after yes, a lifetime of yes. kind of glorifying her, <laughs> which I thought was kind of interesting and unusual because most people hate their parents as teenagers and in their twenties, but you, it seemed like you didn't do that. Um, no, 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 no. We were incredibly close um, mm -hmm. growing up because it was just she and I, and she is, she is a, a very, and this is another thing I've learned about mothering as I've gone along. I think there are parents, there are parents who are really, someone said to me, she was like, you know, I'm a really good teen mom. I wasn't, you know, great with the baby stage. You know, you have your lifetime with them, right? Totally. I was a terrible teen mom. I hated <laughs> teenagers. <laughs> so I think she, you know, she, her personality, her spirit is so great with young kids going even into my teen years. But I think there was a break between us. Um, one, because, you know, I went really far away to college. It's just the two of us. So she just kind of, kind of was doing her thing. I was doing my thing. I'm a really independent person. And when it came time for me to step into this caregiving role, because we we're in a sandwich generation, I am in a sandwich generation of young kids and an older parent. Yep. I just, I didn't feel prepared. I didn't think that I was the nurturing maternal type and suddenly had to come into this role where I'm taking care of my mom. Um, and that got me to thinking about motherhood in general and, and mothering, whatever that is, this, you know, this umbrella term for it. And the, the idea that there's only like a, a certain type of personality that's good at it, right? And I don't think that's true, right? Because I don't have the, you know, warm and fuzzy. I, can, I'm, I am warm and fuzzy with my girls. I love them to death, but like, no, I'm I get not, it. We all have different mothering personalities. Yeah, you know, and the truth is, though, mothers are. I mean, this isn't really what your book is about. This may be a later book for you. I mean, like mothers are vilified in ways. Mothers are blamed for everything. So you can't really win, right? No matter what kind of mother you are. But what you're grappling with in the book really is how do I be black to <laughs> raise my kids and deal with all the issues I already have? Like well, even when you're talking about authenticity, I mean, like, yes, you're clearly a very in touch with yourself, authentic person, but we're different in different scenarios. And you can't mm -hmm. always, as a black person in America, you don't, you can't, you don't always feel like you can be authentic in certain situations, right? So yeah. how do you raise children to be their authentic selves when you yourself struggle with that? I think that's, right. you know, like it was very moving to me, the part in the book where you acknowledge your kind of relief at not being pregnant with a boy for the first time. Yes. Yes, and that exactly. I totally get that. I mean, we all get that, right? That's, um, do you want to talk about that for a sec? Yeah. And I think, I mean, by we all, I think black women get it. Yes, um, that's what I, mean. <laughs> I am because I did not know again, how I was going to one love this stranger so unconditionally. And I already did. Um, at, I think at that point I was like five months pregnant you know, we very much wanted this baby. We're excited to be pregnant all in having this child. And I still had so much anxiety, right? That was sort of just then starting to creep in about not only how do I be a pregnant black person in America and come out of the hospital unscathed, that was one thing. Yeah. Um, and, but two, how to raise this black person and black identity is very important to me, right? It's not important to all black people and all black parents, right? Raising children with a black, a strong black identity, whatever you define that as. But for me, it was really important. And I didn't realize until our doctor said it was a girl that I had, that I was holding on to all of this stuff and all, there was so much pressure. And when she told me, I just burst into tears. Yeah. When she told, told me we were having a girl, burst into tears. And my husband was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know you wanted a girl so badly. And I was like, I didn't either. And it wasn't that I wanted a girl so badly. I just, I couldn't, the idea of having a boy was just going to be another- A weight. whole other layer of worry. Yes. And um, recognizing that and realizing that, not even in that moment. I mean, it took me a while afterwards to even start to unpack that and what that means and how I talked, there's a whole chapter in the book about sort of like the invisible labor that- parents of color have that, you know, white parents don't have and will never have or understand. And that's part of it. 
you know, I, I highly doubt there was there is a point as a, as a white mother, she's going through something that she would burst into tears because she's afraid her son would be killed. You know, like that is not some oh, of right. the burden that they care. You want a white male boy, right? That seems like the easiest thing to have. Um, but no, I, you know, I took care of my brother after my mom died and my brother, um, we're, we're both mixed and he, he, he reads black, but he's very light skinned. And I realized at times when he was growing up that I, that, that that I had it easy in that way that I was that, that made it easier taking care I didn't, mm. there were things I didn't have to worry about as much raising my brother mm. helping my brother grow up it's scary it's really horrible so okay there's another really moving chapter in the book I don't want to give too much away but that scene in the playground with um what's that the boy is that naughty boy major bullying major. The playground. that's a really powerful chapter um so your family's in the playground and there's a boy who's kind of giving a, a, a white girl a hard time. There's a little black boy who seems maybe unattended, but it's not really clear. And he's giving a, he's kind of tormenting a little girl over a bicycle, I think. And um, your husband kind of gets up to get involved, really just trying to be helpful, right? And then uh -huh. these white people, who, tell me the story. Tell me a little bit if you don't. <laughs> Man, dad, I call him. And yeah, dad. well, one, um, and that is, well, one of the reasons why going back, I wrote the chapter about gentrification, right? There's literally a whole chapter in the book that's just Yeah, about it's a great chapter on gentrification. In fact, wait, Helen, I should tell you, I don't know if you know the writer Bliss Broyard, but she's a really good friend of mine. And Bliss is writing a book about gentrification in Fort Greene. And I sent her a copy, a picture of your book. It was like, you have to read this and you have to talk to her. She's a journalist too. Um, oh, wow. But she's working on a book really about this in Fort Greene. Yes. And I should definitely talk. But anyway, go on. Absolutely. I mean, the 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 concept of gentrification what's it what it's doing to communities what it's doing to people about uh, these questions of identity is huge right we'll be talking about it forever but the reason why i wanted to write that chapter because i wanted once you got to this next chapter which was a couple chapters later understanding that this playground right it in our neighborhood was existed as such a raw nerve in terms of all of the pieces of class race um you right, know, the new people coming in old neighborhood versus new all of it converges on this playground the playground that now exists as this beautiful green space it used to be an elementary school an elementary school that was emptied out as people fled the neighborhood and then it was empty and abandoned they tore it down and now they built this this beautiful playground that is across the street from public housing um so at any given moment you could be there in the moment morning and there's all of the you know nannies who speak french or who knows what plus kids from across the street who may be over there un unattended, parents, you know, it's it's just this, this crazy melting pot. And we were there, my husband and I and my mom, because she lived with us for a year, which was its own, its own bag of beans. Um, and we were there with, with um, this white couple, the mother of whom, the, the mother who I'd met at baby yoga. Okay, so that just like tells you what is happening. And there's a little boy, I call him major in the book. That's not his name, no, you know, changed all the names. And he was just harassing this little girl, right? And more than like a regular, he was cutting up at the playground, right? And so fine, then my, you know, we tried to step in, my husband and I tried to, you know, really mainly rob. She was like, my man, my man, like stop, right? And so finally the girl and her dad, and they're these white parents, these, these white folks, they are leaving. And, and something I say in the book is like, you know, white parents, and I've noticed this in our neighborhood, are very, very hesitant to correct or discipline a black children family. who are not theirs, black children who are not theirs, right? And that is the correct thing. Um, but, you know, he was cutting up. So finally, they, they are leaving. And this dad, like, sort of like conspiratorially, like pulls us in. He's like, oh, you know, can I get your number? And we're both thinking, like, we don't know you like that. Why would you want our number? And he's like, you know, can I get your number? Because there's all these programs in the city where you can get, you know, free bikes or, or really discounted bikes. And we're, we're so confused, like what? looking at him, like, why are you telling us this? And I'm looking at Rob, like, why is he telling us about these bikes? And then it dawns on us that he thinks this is our son right. and that we can't afford a bike. Right. Right. And I have no filter. So literally I look at him, I was like, this is not our effing kid. Right. And right the way and of course Robert looks at me like girl what's wrong with you and and like the man the dad is just sitting there and it's like he must have been horrified it's like he looks at us and then finally re recognizes like oh oh this is I have miscalculated I've um and so he leaves he's he's like he's like oh sorry he's obviously like just you know mortified and he leaves 
And then Rob and I are just sitting there with this, like, they don't even see us, you know, but the more evocative, I think, tone of that chapter, and I talk and I go deeper as the pages go on, is that separating ourselves from this little boy is never my goal, right? I did not grow up with anything, um, material, like a lot of right. material things. Like I was that boy. So like, who am I to say like, this isn't our kid? Of course, this is my kid, right? right? Of course. But well, that's like a double feeling in the chapter that's complicated. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. And so it's just like, okay, I want band dad to see me, but am I seeing major, right? And then finally we find, you know, we find his dad who comes, you know, in a, in a cloud of, of, of weed smoke and, and curse words and all of this stuff. And major in my mind, my mom starts crying. It's like this whole thing. Right, because on the one hand, you want to feel distance from this kid. This kid is not your kid. Your kid is not behaving no. bad. This is not your problem no. just because you're black. You're not this kid. On the other hand, you are black and this kid yeah. matters to you and you don't want to leave him in the dust. And I mean, I've been, I totally know that right. scenario. Right. And it's super complicated and really interesting. It is. Doing. It's complex, especially when we exist in these neighborhoods where, you know, the social situation can, is, is so like pulled apart, but we're still black here. You know what I mean? Like, you know, my black neighbors still feel like a connection to me as they should. And I feel a connection to them as I should. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, when I'm at the playground, you playing, you know, Megan the Stallion all out when our kids are playing, like turn that shit down. Like right. and, that and, at time, and at the same time, as you point out, not all black moms are the same. Like everyone yeah. feels differently about you know race and what they want for their kids. And I mean, you talk about that in the when you're talking about COVID and the pods, right? And you try mm -hmm. to pod with some black women and you're like, you know what, this is <laughs> we don't need to do this. Too much. They were doing too much. They were doing too much. I wasn't, I was like, oh mm, yeah, I'm not doing it. Right. Because, and I talk about in the book, the work of um, Don Dow, who's a sociologist at the University of Maryland. She has this great book called Mothering While Black. I wanted to interview her for the book, but she's way too busy. Um, where she specifically deals in, delves into middle-class Black motherhood. And she puts people in these categories. She does like, you know, she's done hundreds of interviews, talked to these women. And she, call, and she puts people in these categories. I think it was the border crossers, border policers and border transcenders, right? Mm -hmm. And like a border crosser is someone who probably grew up in, grew up working class and is now in, has climbed the ladder, mm -hmm. right? And what they think about black identity, how they mm -hmm. want to confer black identity on their kids. They want their kids to move through all different social structures. They want their kids to be down basically. And that's me, I, I always felt like that was me. Mm -hmm. And then there's a border policers who are usually people who grew up, perhaps they grew up Jack and Jill, Talented 10th, Boulé, yeah. you know, debutantes. And for them, you know, ex being able to navigate society's upper crust is more of their concern. And they define, their Black identity is defined by that. Yeah, by a um, and then there are border transcenders who usually are people in interracial relationships where That's the Black identity is not important to them. Well, like, it's interesting. Like, I think that is me. Like, I was raised by a Black mother um, and my grandmother. I mean, obviously, my whole my mother's side of the family is all Black, and I was very close to them. Um, but I also have a white grandmother and a white father. And so I do feel more fluid about it. And my kids identify as Black, but they're very much mixed. It's 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 different. It's different for everyone. Mm -hmm. it's Absolutely. And we don't, I mean, and that's one of the things I want to do with this book is like, those are the issues of motherhood that we are constantly thinking about. Like we, we have been chewing over these subjects for ever, um, but they never existed in a motherhood memoir. They never existed in a book. No, and that bothered me. <laughs> well, it's also really important, I think, for white women to read books like this. Like, I mm -hmm. think, I mean, I want to ask you at the end, you know, that real question of, so can white women and black women really be <laughs> friends? What's your conclusion? But because that's what I'm interested in, in my community. And I feel like it, 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 you talk about the fundamental distrust that's there, which I'm, you know, obviously well aware of and understand. Um, but in a, in some ways, you also do transcend that. You also admit throughout the book that these women are kind of your posse. These women, you are really comfortable talking to them about all sorts of shit and talking about your problems. And you know, you go to them, you trust them. 
And then there's this other, then, and then at the same time, there is this reality that there's this fundamental kind of schism between white women and black women and will it mm-hmm. ever be healed? And so I think reading books like this, like I, I'd love you to talk for a sec, if you would, about the chapter about the talk, you call it, I think the other talk or the mm-hmm. endless talk, or what do you say? The other oh, talk. One of your chapters is called Those Fucking Girls, which is cool to this. <laughs> but the talk chapter, you know, made me cry. Like, I mean, this yeah. is real and it's really, and then when your daughter says she wants to be purple that was so great but anyway talk to us a teeny bit about that if you would about that the other talk chapter yeah Yeah, that that was that specifically and I don't write this in the book but it's something I've, I've come to like synthesize as I've talked about it more and more I think the other talk is significant and and that is about everyone knows about the talk right well now more people are aware of the talk right just for listeners who don't know what the talk is the talk is when you talk to your black children about how to deal outside in the world with police with people of authority basically how to not die out in the world exactly how to keep themselves safe in that type of situation right we're trying to keep them as safe as we possibly can so we're trying to understand you know discuss this with them Um, But the other talk was, is this idea of even talking to your children and explaining that they're Black, explaining race, this ridiculous concept, right, explaining it to your children. And I think what I found in talking to other middle class Black parents about it is that so many of us don't have that specific talk, right? We just assume by osmosis because I do all the things, you know, my daughter takes ballet, her ballet teacher is black. I have banded with other parents to make sure there are four black girls in that ballet class. You know, we just, you know, exactly. Like we live in DC, our mayor is black. Her school principal is black. Her pediatrician is black. We've just like surrounded her in this way. We're like, okay, she just kind of gets it. And we never have specifically talked to her about that. And when I talk to other parents and she's young, right? She's five other Black parents about it. They had the same experience, but we had this experience where our children came up against microaggressions as preschoolers, right? Um, And the first thing my Black parents would say is we hadn't even told her she was Black. You know, we we knew she knew. So like when she was confronted by this, she's just like, well, why are you, why are you saying this about me? me Like, I don't understand. Um, And in, in the same token, white parents, when they find out that their kid has done this terrible thing, are like, well, we don't know where they got it from. Well, and because white parents aren't talking about race at home. Like, right. white people think if we don't talk about it, if we talk about it, it means it, it's, it's racist. It's dangerous. It's racist. They think I talking know. about race in and of itself is racist, right? And that's just not me saying it. This is what the research bears out. Yeah. Even though we know that children, uh, babies, know how to recognize phenotypic difference, right? And preschoolers know difference, recognize difference. And by, and four and five-year-olds start to assign different behaviors to different races from the things that they are getting by osmosis and the things that they see their parents doing, right? If we're in the car, you lock the door every time I see a black person walk by. Like these types of things, or, you know, yes, my parents pay all the slip service. We have all the books. Um, but my parents don't have any black friends. They don't have any black friends. There are no, right? black, there are no black, black people at this. The black you heart, me to. There's no black people at the soccer camp you send me to. That starts to tell them who's important and who's not. Absolutely. Um, and so that's something I had to recognize and realize of, of how we're raising the girls too. I'm like, okay, we're going to start talking about this. I don't talk, talk about it in the book, but there was this point where we're in the car I was listening to NPR, it was Amani Perry talking about her book and talking about not wanting to teach her son's white supremacy, basically. And um, Sally in the back, my daughter was like, well, I like Brian, he's white, he's a good person. And I was like, oh my God. You know, of course it was this moment where I was like, we're gonna talk about race now, you know? And instead of running from it, I said, you're right. Brian is a good person and he's your friend and you trust him and he's nice to you. That's what is important. Yeah. And like, we just went there. That's as much as I wanted to do right there. I didn't want to go, but some people, uh, you know, I just wanted to keep it there. Like that's what's important. He's your friend. You trust, he's a good friend to you. So that's your friend. You're right. He's a good person. And so are you. Um, But not running from those conversations and getting ready for those conversations. Another thing I, I, yeah. 
No, go. I'm just saying, and getting ready for them when they're still complicated for you is what's the heart. It's yes. the crux of what's so hard about being a parent. Because mm-hmm. it's that like you have white friends who you like and you trust and they're good to you, but do you always trust them? Mm-hmm. Where does that, you know, how do you, how do you figure out that line? It's hard. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's really difficult, but I think also what I've learned through that chapter and talking about it is that for me as a black mother, I know I am raising black children. Mm-hmm. That is important to me. That is what I'm doing. Whatever we define black up in here as though that's how I'm raising my daughters. And I'm clear on that. And that's important to me. And I recognize that they're viewed out in the world as black women and that they will get all the greatness of that and the crappy parts. Mm -hmm. I don't think white parents realize they're raising white children. Mm. And that's when you get this, well, I don't know where they get it from. They get it from you, girl. It's you. That's a really good point. And you're right. They they don't think they're raising white children because they just it's it's the whole assumption thing right it's the whole privilege yes. thing. they're just raising kids exactly. raising kids you're where are all these white people come from right if you're not ra- raising white children where, where are they coming from where are they who are the white children they're yours right right and so you need to think about how they move out in the world just like i have to think about how my children move out in the world yeah yeah and i think when they just, when we start to have that real conversation those re- realizations not us because we know but them Um, I think we can, when we talk about trust and we talk about building trust and true connections, that is when that can happen. And that takes patience. That takes a lot of patience. Someone asked me the same thing about sort of like, you know, can, can interracial friendships ever work because can you view the humanity in someone else? And yes, you can obviously, but it does not happen right away. Right. I don't think. No, it takes and a long time. It takes a long time. And too often when we come parents, this idea like, oh, we're all on the playground, we're all at the farmer's market, we're all at the splash pad, like we all think the same, and this is all, you know, kumbaya, hunky dory. And it's like, no, 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 you don't know about my invisible diaper bag, <laughs> you know? Right. And until you recognize that, no, we can't truly, truly be friends. We can be playground friends. All right. For but- those of you who don't know, invisible diaper bag is a reference to invisible <laughs> pack. <laughs> Which, do you want to explain that? Because not everyone's- Well, just this idea that there is so much more that we are coming to the table with when it comes- we're caring. There's more that we're, if if you're a person of color, you're caring more than a person of skin privilege or whatever is is caring, right? You Exactly. That's really what you get from this book. And that is why white women should really read this book. Because like there, you have that one friend in there who at first you, there's a friend that she mistaken thinks she's maybe a light-skinned Latina. I think her daughter's name is Carmen. And and she ends up just being a white woman who's just particularly genuinely woke and cool. And is just like sending her kid to public school with a lot of kids of color. And like, it's just genuinely doing it right for whatever yes. reason. Um, yes. And and it's it's funny to watch you kind of, you acknowledge you like her and you kind of trust her. And then you're you know, always a little like, is she going to surprise me? And and it's not to say that in no way in this book are you walking around like hating on all these women. That's what's so great about it. There's just this nuanced complication of the reality that you're carrying a backpack they're not carrying. Yes. And, and yet you need them and like them and need the community. And um, it's, it's it's very real. Thank you. Yeah. And that's funny that you meant you, you mentioned her because yes, at first we would see each other out at at playground things. And at this, you know, as we're all visiting schools for, you know, the school lottery and all that stuff. And I could, I would have sworn to you that she was Spanish, right. Only because she always gravitated towards the moms of color, Mm -hmm. unlike the other moms, Mm -hmm. right. She always gravitated towards the moms of color. And I was like, okay, you know you never know how people present like you know she's down she's cool and then I didn't find out that she was white it was like the big reveal like oh she's actually white I didn't realize she was white until we were at a meeting we're at a a school meeting we're all going to because again the black moms and the white moms were all doing this intensive mothering right so we're all visiting every charter school and public school within a 20 mile radius before our kids, kids even go to preschool right um filling out the Excel spreadsheets, this school versus that school, what are we going to choose, yada, yada, yada. We're all in this, doing this crazy crap together. And this one woman at this meeting that we were at, like this, this open house we were at, 
this woman stood up and she was talking about how, and this was a white woman. She was talking about how like, she was so happy that her child got to go to this bilingual school and meet all these different types of people. And she was like getting teary eyed and it was just like, okay, girl. Mm -hmm. um, and then my friend, she texted us. She was like, I, I feel so embarrassed for white people right now for my people right now. And I was like, she is white. I did not realize. But she has become a good friend. Her her daughter is a you know a good friend of mine. And it's funny. I trust there's only a, a, a handful of parents in our neighborhood that we trust, like with our kids for real. Like, oh, can you pick my kid up and keep her for an hour because I'm busy doing a podcast? Like something like that. And she's like creeping on that edge of of yes, we would like let you. <laughs> Like be around our kid well because we i'm a big there. believer i mean also and i'm sure you feel this way i'm a big believer i mean obviously you want your kids to be safe but i think it is important to let kids know that they can be taken care of by lots of different kinds of people and as a mom of black kids you also want them to feel comfortable with white people so yes. you know, then that's complicated also i mean i keep saying complicated but you know you need to make sure they're safe emotionally safe, obviously physically safe, but you also do want, like, that's great if they have, if a friend of yours is white that they can really trust and like, because that helps them grow up in the world and know that there are really good white people. A absolutely. And then it also, I think, I talk in the book about like the, the tradition of black parenting and community parenting and other mothering, right? Like, I don't know how you grew up, but I grew up when in certain pockets, right? Cause we were always all over the place, but there were certain communities we lived in where it's like, yeah, if my mom wasn't around, I knew I could go with Miss X, Y, and Z. And she, if she saw me doing some foolishness, she could like check me and tell my mom about it. Like there was more community type yeah. parenting that we have lost. Yeah, totally. Um, when you live in an urban environment, like neither my husband nor I are from DC. So it's just like part of us wanting to be in this community and and know other parents and and connect with them in a real it's way essential. it's is essential. part of it yeah yeah although you'll see like once they hit like 12 you start to talk about this toward the end of the book and it gets more and more once they're in middle school those relationships almost all evaporate it's the weirdest thing like i i had a whole world of parent friends and then once they're in like middle and high school you start to realize oh these aren't really friends i chose they're friends Mm -hmm. needed for by proximity on, but proximity and developmental and blah 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 and and then there's a real liberation suddenly you're like oh, <laughs> I I just decide who i actually want to be around <laughs> i love that um, it's great well um all right so we'll wrap up in a sec but i i am curious like if it's changed i mean obviously you're growing all the time we're all growing right you're you said you're 41 now Yes, I'll be 42 next month. So having can you happy birthday. Having written <laughs> these two books about like black identity and being black and like going through 2020 and George Floyd. And do you feel I don't know, better, like things are better? Do you feel any sense of or do you feel more discouraged like having written a book like this? I definitely don't feel more discouraged. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think what I talk about in the book um this spreadsheet <laughs> that um yeah. I was about to say the excel spreadsheet <laughs> that was actually super good you tell us about yeah. that so your realization about that was good about this spreadsheet that friends of mine I mean, these are people that I have considered friends known them for a while we built a longer relationship I trust them etc cetera, etc cetera. and after George Floyd they started uh, on their own no one asked me nobody was like as our black friend how do you feel about that no they started building up this list of books about basically like anti-racist books for like little kids, right? And I remember being like, just get books with brown faces in them. But I was just like, kept to myself. And they like built this whole, there were TED Talks, a list of BIPOC bookstores to get them from. It was a very intensive mothering, conservative cultivation. These are all like sociological terms way a little a little performative and definitely like yeah. value what's the word value signaling, what's signaling the word? Yes. virtue signaling virtual, i never know i think I, yes so it was that but not because i mean this is something that we they were just like doing within our group it's not like they were like putting this to this larger group it was something they were doing within our our small group and like i remember wanting to just like really hate on it you know um because i am a cynical person like really hate on it at first but once I opened it one and realized we only had two books on the whole list uh, of like 40, 
but also open it and realize like this is them doing something you know what i mean like they felt like they could do something they felt like they needed to do something and i think that that in and of itself was hopeful whether they did it whether they looked through the books bought the books whatever but they actually felt like something needed to be done and they knew that they needed to do it yeah i mean that they that it wasn't me right i was supposed to explain x y and z to them that they needed to do these things right and i think just having the knowledge that there needs to be a change again like i said like you are raising white kids mm -hmm. acknowledging that you are raising kids with this privilege mm -hmm. how do you counteract it just like you know there's a, a good friend of mine this isn't in the book because it happened recently it's a black woman married to another black woman and she sent us in the black mom group because again i'm in a million groups on the black mom chat she was like hey can you all, you know, we're having these issues with our daughter on the playground of her, like it being difficult for her to explain her her family, right? Not only that she has two moms, but two moms, moms are married. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're married, right? And so then we got into this large, she was like, you know, can you just like kind of reinforce at home, like, you know, that families look different. And instead, and this is the black mom chat. So instead of someone being like, well, we always, we were like, yes, what do you need and of course someone asked like you know what books <laughs> right because that's true right. like, what books because do you that's something you can do yeah right that yeah. we should be reading to them and then we got into this larger conversation that was really interesting about different families in, in a lot of different ways right there were another there's another black couple in the group who they're not married mm -hmm. right they've been together for decades but they're not and so she was making the point she was like yeah and fan like her, my friend's point was like, yes, these two moms can be married. My other friend's point was like, yes, and this mom and dad could still be mom and dad, but not married, mm -hmm. right? And, and another person in the group is um, a single mom by choice and what that looks like, right? You know, so it, we had this longer conversation about this and how, because I know I'm raising like heteronormative kids for, for now. Or no, you never know. See the, yeah, right, exactly. Kids who see this heteronormative construct Mm -hmm. and me wanting to make sure that they don't then put that on kids make assumptions life, right okay. right um so that is in in that is a privilege in its way and it it absolutely is a privilege and what i do to deconstruct that and that i have to do that work as well exactly um, i mean that's what you do with that spreadsheet i mean basically you talk about the spreadsheet and you're kind of derisive of it and then you open it up and you're like oh i don't actually have most of these books <laughs> and so it's good it's a moment of like kind of slightly begrudging generosity to these women and saying yeah they're doing something and they yes. are trying and even though it doesn't always land right like let's give them that and yeah. and that's good because we all yeah. do need to be you know in the same way like the two black moms need to be generous to you realizing that you may not understand every aspect of this and you're willing to learn like we all yes. have, i mean it's how exactly. i am i always say like with all the gender stuff like i'm 53 it's been a little harder for me to get with it and i'm really trying and you know so when i make a mistake with pronouns hopefully people will be nice to me um yes it's trying and that's a, a point uh one of my friends in the book shilpi makes when we sat down we had this conversation about like school choice um and you know the in the invisible parent population that we started talking about, which is like, you know, parents of color of a certain mm -hmm. means or whatever that yeah. we don't seem that way. Um, and she was talking about the neighborhood, talking about gentrification, talking about it, how it's like this once in a lifetime chance of so many different types of people to be up against each other. And she was like, I, and, and there's all kinds of microaggressions and, and uncomfortable moments. And she was like, I just try to keep in my mind that everyone is trying. Now, not everybody is. <laughs> right yeah talk about the books not everybody is but for the people that you see who are trying i'm not giving them credit cuz you know i'm trying all the time but it gives me i, I it doesn't discourage me it makes yeah. me feel like okay someone is is doing something um and it, yeah. it, it in the, and i think about i think what folks don't also realize is now i I, I think about the, their kids, right? Because that's my thing. It's like, your kids are playing with mine. Like, do you realize, like, I am pouring into my two so much that can be, like, you know, emptied to zero by a name your kid calls mine, right? So I just want to make sure you're doing the work. And for the people who I can see doing the work, those people I feel more comfortable around. 
So have you gotten much feedback um, from white readers yet? I mean, the book just- I have. Out. You have. I have, yeah. I have. Um, most that it's great um, and that it is not like, you know, teaching them something, even though I think they sh should be learning things, but just that <laughs> it's a perspective that they, that they did not fully take into account yeah. before, right? And then for, um, even though a, a friend of mine, um, I think I call her Melissa in the book, she texted me the other day. She was like, they're having secret white meetings about your book, girl. Like, you know, people who are so afraid. Well, they that probably are. I got to say your friend, I'm sure. your neighborhood, I'm sure. they're having my neighborhood. Secret secret conversations about this book no yes. doubt about it but Absolutely. I mean it really I actually I didn't really think of it that way but I'd be curious to see how many white women read it I mean versus black women I mean obviously I guess more black women will read it just from an obvious publishing perspective they'll sell it to black women but white women really are the ones who should be reading this book Absolutely. That's I mean I think it is a book where we can be in conversation yeah yeah right? it's totally. a book where we can be and that is why the art looks like it does like yeah. it is a book about being in conversation or having a conversation and while yeah. I wrote it for moms like me moms who look like me moms who have my experience so that they feel validated and seen no you're not crazy this yeah is crazy but really the conversation that we can have around the themes of the book which you know can be so vast. Yeah. Uh, I think is is it's real, it's true impact. impact. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your point about women also, I mean, definitely women of color should read this book because they will feel validated. And that's often what community, like the ones you're talking about or my community, that's what community does, right? It makes you feel seen and understood and heard. And women need to hear this because I don't think this, I don't think the book like this has been written before. So guys, for everyone listening, this is Helena Andrews Dyer, The Mamas, What I Learned About Kids, Class, and Race from Moms Not Like Me. And it just came out. This is a galley, but it just came out in hardcover. Um, it's a really fabulous book about race and class and raising kids. And, um, it's a memoir, but it's really a lot of journalism and reporting and it's very, very well done and good research and super, super funny. Um, what more can you ask? I love a funny book. Um, <laughs> so how can people find you? Um, me, so I am on Facebook. Uh, Helena Andrews Dyer on Twitter at Helena underscore Andrews and on Instagram at Helena underscore Andrews. Um, I'm a reporter for the Washington Post. Um, so you can always find my work there. And yeah, as I continue to do work around the book and the topics that are involved in the book, I think it, it'll, you know, like branch out and you'll see a website and all that kind of stuff. But like, I am just I'm just a writer. I'm around. You're just a writer, you know. You're just yes. A good writer. I hope it'll Google be me. a good mommy book club book. That's really what should happen to it. So I'm going to be praying for you that that happens. Which is your favorite social media platform? Which do you use the most? Oh, I probably use Facebook the most because I'm old, right? Isn't it <laughs> old people use Facebook? You. You're not that old. I'm old. I mean, <laughs> you you should not be on Facebook. Oh, like I, it is Facebook. Like I am old, like literally I am of the generation where Facebook first started like that. Is, so wow. I use Facebook, Twitter I'm on, but I don't understand it. I don't understand Twitter either. Yeah. yeah. And I was late I to the Instagram game. I now do Instagram, but I was like way late. So yes, anyway. I'm also late. You said Jonica, um, our mutual friend, Jonica Reed was on the call and you know, Jonica knows she's always trying to get me on the latest thing. And I'm, and she'll be like, I'll give you a tutorial. And like when clubhouse first started and I was like, Oh yeah, oh, no. you know, <laughs> you know, full well, this is, she was like, there's good conversations happening, Helena. And she, because she knows I'm the worst, but yeah, I am, I am old. I'm on Facebook. My yeah, I couldn't get into clubhouse and, and, yeah. and Jonica, I'm going to look you up when I'm in Dallas next. My son, my youngest child just moved to Texas and it turns out. Oh. And so I went to Fort Worth and I posted about it and Jonica was like why didn't you look me up and I forgot that she was there so I will mm -hmm. next time well it was great to meet you and we'll edit out all the sound stuff that happened in the beginning and I just <laughs> applaud you and um you know thank you for writing this book and I hope lots of women read it and talk about it so thank you thank you so much Nina this was great and thanks to meet um, you I hope I meet you in person one day yes absolutely next time you're in DC yeah absolutely all right take care bye everyone thanks for joining us bye-bye